Welcome to Not Your Ordinary Parts, a podcast where we talk about hard things associated with the human experience with the goal of increasing awareness, growth, and healing. You may hear information from professionally licensed therapists, life coaches, healers, doctors, etc. This information is not medical advice or therapy and is not meant to replace actual therapy or instructions given by a doctor or a personal therapist. I'm your host, Jalan Johnson. My guest today is Santiago Ramirez, or Santi as he goes by. Santi is a breathwork facilitator and somatic practitioner who specializes in somatic de-armoring, trauma-informed breathwork, and energy activation. Santi co-founded the Somatic Energy Alignment Process, which is a healing journey that allows for nervous system regulation and the restoration of spinal energy flow by blending breathwork, somatic de-armoring, and energy transmission to facilitate the release of blockages by promoting a greater sense of flow and alignment in all aspects of being. Santi is passionate about exploring human consciousness and wholeheartedly dedicated to the path of serving others by helping them to remember their own innate healing capacity. So Santi, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you. Thank you, brother, for having me here, for, yeah, uh, welcoming me to, to be here in your podcast, talking to your audience, sharing my journey, sharing the tools that I've been gathering in the last 10 years in my own healing journey and the ones that I put now into the service of others. So it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, brother. Likewise. Um, also, I gave a, a brief introduction. But so that the audience can get to know you a little bit better, would you mind telling us a little bit about your story and your background and how you got to who and where you are today? So basically, that's that's a long story. I'm going to kind of <laughs> summarize the whole uh, journey that have put me into this present moment, as I told you, serving others and developing what you say, which is the somatic alignment process, the somatic energy alignment Mm, I'm an industrial engineer by background. That's kind of my academic background. Uh, I was immersed in this kind of life where I thought that everything was, was perfect by that time. Having a successful career in a corporate job, uh, following all of kind of this life that they told you when you are a teenager, when you are a kid, that you need to follow, get a good job, get more money, get married by the age of 30 keep kind of escalating into that uh, ladder of success that the society kind of tried to impose out there until one day the whole kind of illusion collapsed. Uh, I broke up with my girlfriend. We were about to get married and she decided that we were not a good fit to each other anymore. And I just realized that the life that I was living, it was just that, it was just an illusion. There was a life that it was not my life, but the life that my parents wanted me to live. I guess that many people kind of resonate with that, that the society wanted me to have, but it was not fulfilling at the end. I didn't feel kind of, I was following my purpose. And that initiated a whole kind of quest. That's why I call kind of, when I explain it, the the first call of the of the hero's journey or, or my own journey to discover what I wanted to do in life. Uh, as many of you out there kind of resonate with that, I started kind of try, trying to fill the void inside me with different things in the outer world. So going to party every single day, more women to try to feel kind of that emptiness that I was feeling because my girlfriend was not with me. Uh, alcohol trips all around South America. I'm from Colombia, so in one year I traveled Brazil, Bolivia, Peru. I went to the United States like two or three times. And every time that I come back to that life that I had, I kept kind of feeling empty, that the void that was actually there. So I say, okay, I cannot fill this with things from the outer world and I need to start looking inside. So I kind of accepted that invitation of my inner self and I ended up studying uh, philosophy. I met my first mentor. So if we take it from the hero's journey, actually from, from Joseph Campbell, I ended up meeting that, that mentor that took me into the depth of my inner darkness and showed me that I just needed to rebuild 
my whole my whole perception or my whole foundation to be able to come out of the abyss or that darkness with new tools that allow me to embody my purpose. So the last 10 years, everything started studying philosophy from taking breath work and realizing as we were talking before we started recording that the body is also a, 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 a great part to approach kind of your own inner healing that is not just your mind. And then I started studying breath work, somatic therapy, somatic parts work, until I develop uh, my own personal practice, which involves breath work, DR, marine, and movement, to be able to come back to your inner self and to be able to find safety in your own inner experience. So it was 10 years journey that put me into what I do now. And after I touch kind of rock bottom, Wow. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I know that I um, aligned with what you were saying because I think a lot of us kind of have that idea that we have to follow what our parents want for us or what society says we should do. And in the process, you know, we kind of lose ourselves and, and are separated from who we are really supposed to be or what our purpose is. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I totally, I, I like the way you, you, you word it and you say it, like separated from who we are. That's probably a question that we never kind of pause in the day-to-day -day routine and ask ourselves, who am I actually, or who am I beyond what I do? Because when you get to meet someone and you ask them, okay, who are you? You start defining yourself by the roles that you take in the society or by the job that you have or the activities that you do but at the end that's kind of the big question how do you discover yourself and get to connect with your inner essence beyond what you do because even when you're not doing what you do you're still being yourself so that's a good question to throw out there <laughs> i used to love to ask the question um who are you at three in the morning when you're staring at the ceiling and it's just you and your thoughts because that is a hundred percent different from the persona that you have to put on when you go out into the world because a lot of us if we don't really know who we are or we're scared of stepping into our power so to speak we're pretending we're, we're putting on a show for the world Definitely. and and that in and of itself can be so debilitating to our soul and our essence it can be both debilitating, but it's also encouraging if you don't get to find an answer. So it gives you that drive to start that journey or to start that quest, because that's, that's where the quest kind of comes from, from a question. So you already have the question and you can embark in a different journey to rediscover and reshape who you are. Like just throwing something out there also, that's kind of the first question. Every time that I have a retreat, a training, that's the first question that I ask all the participants. Tell me who you are without telling me what you do. And most of us, we struggle to respond, like to answer that, to respond to that kind of question, because we don't, we, we have no idea. We kind of attach an identity related to what we do, to our job, to our activities, but we don't know who is that person, who is that essence that goes beyond, that is more kind of sacred or higher. So true. So very true. And I love that question. Um, because who you are and what you do are two different things. And I think a lot of us, sometimes if we don't know who we are, we tend to define our identity by what we do. You know, like people will say, well, I'm an accountant. That's what you do. That's not who you are. You know, so that that's a great question. I think a wonderful way to start when you do your programs. Yeah, definitely. And what happened when you're not doing, because, I mean, and it's not, because it's more kind of an invitation not to find the answer. And I don't want to kind of uh, create this false idea that you need to find that answer right here, right now. But just to have the question there, that is something that goes beyond what you're doing, that usually kind of a good way to phrase it is that we, we human beings with not human doings. So who, who is the person beyond the, the, the act, the, the verb? So it's, it's good. And, and it's, uh, I think there is a life 
time journey to be able to discover that because we are also not kind of an estate. We keep discovering ourselves every single day. I love that we're human beings, not human doings. <laughs> That's a good one. Really good one. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So to kind of get into the, the meat and potatoes of the interview, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. And first, um, for people who don't know, and also just to get a, a better understanding, what is somatic energy alignment? So somatic energy alignment is a healing modality that has been developed to help people to reconnect with the inner healing, with the inner healer. I don't usually like to say that I, I am a healer or I heal someone, but I just kind of bring the tools and the space that allow you to connect with that part of you that knows better and allow you to reconnect with that part of you that can bring safety into your body and into your own personal experience. So in somatic energy alignment, I like to divide kind of the, that name in the three words that we use. Somatic, which we are uh, referring to the body, soma. Energy, which is kind of the expansive ethereal feel. So what we are trying to align is the body with the energy that you want to embody in order to 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 get into your higher self so one of the <coughs> sorry one of the quotes that i use the most is like we all want to transform our lives for the better good we all want changes and keep evolving so in order for you to be able to do that you need greater energy to be able to embody greater energy you need actually to align yourself with your higher self. So when we talk about alignment, alignment is just from the word itself, is just to put two, two or more points into a straight line that you are able to connect them. So what we're trying to align in somatic energy alignment is yourself with your inner essence or with your higher self by working on your body and by working on your energy. So it's a bottom-up approach. When we talk about the bottom-up or top-down approach, top-down is therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, where you go and work in the mind in a cognitive way and rationalize most of the things that you do, why those behaviors are being unfold. But in somatic energy alignment, we work from their body, bringing safety to their body so that you are able to embody greater energy. So we transcend their body into the etheric field, expansive energy. And then that you're able to manifest a greater life. And that's the way we, we, we work using breath, energy activations, movement, and somatic de -armoring. What was it that initially got you um, interested in into somatic energy alignment? My own personal journey. So basically, I started because I have asthma. And I say, and I quote unquote, say asthma, because for conventional medicine, they say once asthmatic, you're going to be asthmatic for your whole life. So it's kind of a life sentence, as many other kind of diagnoses that they put out there. And I wanted to become a scuba dive instructor. And to become a scuba dive instructor, you cannot be asthmatic. So kind of. Yeah, every single doctor that I visited since I was a kid until my adult life, they told me you need to be dependent on inhalers to be able to perform, to be able to do any kind of export. And then I ended up realizing that the asthma, it was just a consequence. It was not the problem. It was just a consequence of my body not feeling safe or the stress that I was feeling in my body. I was not able to breathe properly and to expand my breathing capacity and i started working on my own self on my own healing on my own body on how to cure that asthma or how to actually connect with that inner healing that i was talking before and and expand my my lung capacity my respiratory functionality so i started exploring different modalities from those modalities it was breathwork the breathwork that is many people know out there which is holotropic breathwork but also breathwork and understanding the anatomy of your breath. So how your breath actually works. How can I make my breath 
uh, go to the different parts of my body? How can I direct that breath in a, in, in, or how can I manage that breath in the way I want? And how can I make it actually to expand uh, my lungs and to become more functional or to improve my endurance? So I started kind of understanding my own inner self. And then at the end, I was able to actually become a scuba dive instructor. And I just realized that most of those diagnoses that we see out there in conventional medicine, they are really disheartening and they don't give you much hope because you go to the doctor and they say, okay, you have this and you're going to have that uh, diagnostic for the rest of your life. But then if you get to reconnect with your own self and to explore your inner essence, with the commitment and the, with the willingness to heal, there is always hope and there's always options. So what it brought me into this kind of work, it was my own personal journey. I don't think I've ever heard asthma referred to as a symptom. And I think a lot of people hearing that will probably scoff at that. But the fact that you're able and have become a scuba instructor and you couldn't if you had asthma shows that there was some healing there and that maybe you got to a root cause that then alleviated the asthma. It was it was insane, brother, because it might sound woo-woo or like nonsense for many people out there. But I remember that I actually took, um, cause they, to, to be able to, to take the instructor course as a school instructor, they they check your lung capacity and your lung age. And I was 26, 25 by that time. And my lung age, it was 42. So they were 20 uh, in, in terms of the air that they kind of store and how they breathe and how they expand and how they contract and the kind of the motor control that I have uh, uh, in my diaphragm and in my lungs. They say that my respiratory capacity was someone with the age of 42. So it was like 20 years older than me. And it took me around six months changing some habits. Of course, I started doing exercise. I changed some kind of nutrition. I started doing a breathing exercise, meditating, kind of connecting with what I call your own inner healing capacity. And in six months, I took that age from 42 to 32. So I kind of reduced my long age of 10 years in six months when they were actually telling me that I need to be dependent on inhalers my whole life. So I'm, I'm, I'm not talking woo here. I'm telling you like things that are actually factual and that you can measure. That's incredible. Really incredible. Um, and provides hope for a lot of people who may be in a similar situation that there is a path that they can take that would allow for them to have some of the same results as you. Definitely, definitely. I, but I, that's an invitation that I want to put out there for everyone that is listening. And is, if you have been diagnosed with whatever they have told you there, and most of those kind of life sentences that conventional medicine uh, or allopathic medicine tell you that you have to be dependent on certain medication, don't don't throw the towel yet. You know, like start checking other modalities, other healing uh, forms to be able to, to, to connect. There are many out there. And I think that we are in this kind of healing renaissance, if we might call it that way, where people are becoming more conscious of different alternatives that allow them to actually reclaim that sovereignty into how they want to, to feel and how can they actually feel healthy and and take care of their overall well-being without fully just trusting what what doctors are saying and i'm not trying to throw conventional medicine or doctors under the bus because i know that they, they also play a big a significant role out there but but explore different alternatives if if they telling you that you can actually not improve of course of course i mean i think everything has its place but also at a certain point, if you're not getting the answers or the results that you want, it's probably best to kind of take your, your health into your own hands. And um, because, mm. you know, everyone is an expert of their own body. So if you're having symptoms and you're feeling a certain way and someone says, no, it's not that or, you know, that's not true. Listen to your body. I mean, 
your body is your home and you know it best. And I, I understand that you're saying, you know, you're, you're not trying to throw conventional medicine under the bus because conventional medicine has done wonders, but also there, there are other things. You can combine conventional medicine with, with, you know, other things to, to get the results that you want if you're not getting them. Definitely. So I, I do agree with that. Like, yeah, this one aspect of, okay, I do acknowledge that science and research and conventional medicine can help me to a certain point, but sometimes I cannot be dismissive to the fact that I also know better about me. And I like the way you say it, bro, because I usually tell every single client when they come to questions and people are always trying to put the burden on someone else to save them. You know, I have many people like, yeah, give me the answers of my own life. And usually what I tell to every single client is, I, I don't know. You know better than me. What I, I'm going to do now is just help you reconnect with those answers or those certainties or those, or those questions that you need to ask yourself in a kind of better way. So it's just, yeah, connect to yourself. Try to find someone that allow you to, to, to that guide you in through that process if you're not getting the answers that you need. Agreed. Um, as we go through life, there can be things that affect us emotionally, or we may have traumatic events that affect our body. Um, so I wanted to ask you, how can unresolved trauma and emotional dysregulation affect the body from what you've seen in your experience? So emotional dysregulation or nervous system dysregulation is a byproduct of unresolved trauma and what i usually will say is under the lens of unresolved trauma there is zero to no agency in your life you pretty much become the puppet of the puppet master which is the trauma that is still lingering around and trauma might affect your life eh, impacting your body and your overall well-being so it manifests in your body through different symptoms and that take us back to what I was saying at the beginning. Asthma at the end was a symptom of, of, of having a stress or uh, even uh, there's this last book of Gabor Mate, which is called The Myth of Normal. And he addressed the same with people that suffer from asthma. And he said, most of people that suffer from asthma is because it's a prenatal trauma that their mothers, when they were in the womb, their mother was under a lot of stress. And there's a lot of research on that. So what I will say is, yeah, under the, under the lens of trauma, you might manifest a lot of physical symptoms. Your physical, uh, your overall well-being is going to be affected. And when I say that there is no agency, is that you lose the ability to choose in life. Because what trauma does, it put us in an overprotective kind of defensive mode where you are just reenacting the same self-defeating loops over and over again. So the decisions that you're taking are not towards connection and expansion, but towards protection and defensiveness. So most of people that they are the puppet of that puppet master that we call the trauma, they just keep protecting themselves because they cannot experience life in a full in their full expansive capacity. Mm. I like the way you explain that. And I think that trauma may prevent you from being connected to your body or being able to listen to the messages that your body is sending to you because you're in a state of dysregulation and you're defensive. Um, but does the, does the body have a language? The body has a language and is talking to you every single second. Every single second, your body is communicating to you. We have never learned to understand the language of the body because we live in a society that, is, that, that, that glorifies the mind. So we get to understand the language that's being spoken through words, but the body communicates through movement. So if you are not able to actually move properly and you feel that you're more contracted, so your body is trying to tell you something. It doesn't feel safe to actually move in a more expansive flowy way if your body is manifesting any kind of physical symptoms what your body is trying to tell you is always communicating to you if we take it from the neuroscientific approach 
there are more information going from your body, around 80% more information going from your body all the way up to your brain than from your brain down to your body. So we experience life through our body. I, I give this example in most of my workshop, which is if I put my a hand over a candle or over the fire, before I might, before I am I'm able to rationalize or to understand that that fire is actually burning my hand, my body already knows that I'm feeling that burning sensation in my hand through the felt sensation, and I might take my hand away. So your body is always sensing the environment. It's always telling you if the environment is safe or if your environment is dangerous. So when we are actually able to connect with those that information that is being transmitted from the body to the brain, and we understand our body, we are able to find alignment. And I take it back to what I was saying at the beginning. Alignment is to take two points into a, into a place where they connected to align mind, body, heart, and energy. So the body is always talking to you. And that's, that's kind of one of the greatest things or the greatest kind of achievements where we get to relate to trauma in a different way or to repattern those traumatic experiences from the past is that we are able to fully connect to our body and understand when our body is feeling safe or unsafe. If, if I'm not wrong, I think that was reading a research where it says your body is reading the environment seven times per second. That's more than 500 times per minute. And the way it's reading the environment is reading what is going on inside you. That's what we call interoceptive awareness. So how are you feeling? How is your breath feeling? How is your heartbeat? How your organs are functioning? So are you feeling okay? How's the outer space? Does it feel safe to be here? That's what we call extraceptive awareness. And when we are between humans, between humans, nervous system to nervous system, that's kind of uh, in between. So we say, okay, this person that is in front of me, Jalon, the way he is looking at me, the way he's smiling at me, the way he's talking to, to me, the voice tone th that he is using, does it feel safe or is dangerous? So our body is always kind of sensing, and that's what we call neuroception. Those kind of three levels of perception or neuroception is actually perception beyond awareness. So those three levels, interoception, your inner body, your inner experience, extraception, the outer world, and in between, between two different nervous systems, our body is doing that every single second, seven times per second, as I was telling you, I, re I read recently in a research. So that's the way it communicates. When we fail to follow those cues or those answers on how the body is communicating to us, it will manifest in different ways. And usually it's illness, we feel sick, and it will manifest in different symptoms. So the body whispers, if we don't pay attention to those whispers, your body will scream to you. Wow, I love that. The whispers of the body. And and yeah, if we don't listen, it will scream. And like you said, the screams could be illness and other symptoms. Um, and at that point, I think if you, if you didn't listen to the whispers, now you're gonna have to suffer the consequences of, of hearing a body scream. Definitely, definitely. Okay, so if movement can be um, defined as the body's language, how does movement allow the nervous system to unwind the damage from past experiences? So there is a correlation between trauma storing your system and those implicit memories storing your body with your ability to inhabit and embody your body. So embodiment, I call embodiment kind of the ability to inhabit every single part of your body and move freely. And when I say freely, most of people tend to misunderstand I'm, I'm saying flexible, and I'm not saying flexible. You can be as flexible as you want, but sometimes you feel constriction and tension in kind of a different level that is not perceived in a tangible way. So when I say moving freely, and actually it's funny because every time that I talk about this topic, I start moving. If you saw my hands, I start kind of doing this kind of movement because that's my body exploring the space. 
So is that proprioception, uh, proprioceptive awareness? So if I'm able to increase kind of the range of movement or the way I inhabit every single space in my body, every single part, if I'm able to go through the felt sensation, because your body is always having a relationship with the space. Right now I'm sitting in this chair, so I can feel that my buttocks are on the chair, my, my feet are on the floor, my hands are feeling the wind. So when we are able to go through those felt sensations and actually inhabit our body, we say that we are fully reconnecting with our own inner experience. And as you mentioned before, one of the effects of trauma is that you tend to dissociate because the world out there is so painful that we disconnect from our body. So when we're fully disconnected from our body because of any traumatic experience, because unresolved trauma, we don't get to experience the world. We don't get to move freely through the world. So basically to unwind the trauma that is a store, it will be to bring some movement into the body without forcing it. So the more that we keep releasing and working on the release of trauma, the body will feel more expansive. And the more that the body feels expansive, the more energy that we are able to store and to move in that kind of inner flow. And the more that we are able to move that energy, the more that we get to explore our relationship with this space, with our own selves, and with people around us. Okay, so talking about trauma and movement in the body and how trauma that is stuck in the body could um, cause the body to start to scream if we didn't listen to those whispers. Um, how do you and what does it mean to de-armor the body? Basically, to de-armor the body, we need to understand what is an armor. So every single traumatic experience or stressful experience will create an imprint in your body that will guard yourself down. So it creates kind of a defense if you were not able to process that traumatic experience. If you did, why you were not able to process that traumatic experience? Because you either didn't have the tools by that time, you didn't have the resources, you didn't have the consciousness to process that event, or you simply didn't have the time. And when I say the time, usually that happened with people that suffer kind of a car accident, that it's so kind of shocking and abrupt, and it kind of disrupt your sense of balance that you don't have time to react. So every single experience that you are not able to process in, in the moment, it will create a guard, it will create an armor in your body and in your mind. What we call the guards of your mind is what people refer to as the ego. So your ego is a self-protective mechanism that you build and then you start developing certain behaviors. But your ego has different components that I call the armors in your body. The most common armor, just to give you a clear example, is people that, or, or that I see in my clients in the day-to-day -day basis, is people that they have been betrayed in one of their relationships. You get to see that they tend to, to hunch the shoulders forward because they're trying to protect the heart. So the heart, they have been heartbroken in the past. They're not allowing themselves to trust again. And they actually think that if they jump into another relationship, they, they will be betrayed again. So which is interesting is the armor is protecting you from what you want the most. Because if you have been betrayed in the past, what you want the most is to build a relationship or to find a relationship where you are going to be nourished, where you are going to be nurtured, and when you actually feel that love and can experience that expansive love of a relationship. But because you are armoring yourself, you're not allowing yourself to actually find that relationship because your body doesn't feel safe. So your armors, before I actually answer the question about what is the armoring, your armors are protective mechanisms that you build according to the different experiences that have created some pain in the past and you were not able to process. And that's something that I want to address and every time that I talk to people about armors is it's not about getting rid of the armors. When I say about the armoring, 
is first what you need to do is to acknowledge that the armor is serving a purpose and the purpose is the purpose towards protection. Because I have many clients, bro, that come to me and say, yeah, I want to get rid of this. I feel that every time that I want to connect, my 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 body kind of contracts or my body kind of clinch or, or I don't feel that I can trust and I end up kind of running away from the relationship and I'm tired of this. The, the armors are not trying to harm you. They're trying to protect you because at some point in your life, it was so painful that what your nervous system and your body in their own wisdom, in their infinite intelligence are doing is, I'm going to help you with this. You cannot handle life. And because I'm going to help you and because I know that it was painful in the past, I'm going to protect you. So the first thing to be able to de-armor your body, you need to acknowledge and be grateful for those armors that they were built in the past and they kept you protected. When you are fully able to acknowledge and to feel grateful for them and to say, okay, I feel safe now. I'm ready to let this armor go. I'm ready to actually put my body into a more expansive position, into a more expansive posture. I'm able to open my heart to love again. When you're able to acknowledge that, we can do the somatic part, which is working on the body. But if you come and approach the armor without trying to get rid of it, it's not going to vanish or it's not going to dissolve. Because what I say is that the armor has a consciousness. And every single uh, organism that has a consciousness in this universe, it's, it, it has one purpose, which is to survive, which is to keep themselves alive. So it's the same with the armor. The armor will say, if you go with that approach, I don't, I don't feel that you're safe now. I don't feel that, that, that I I actually need to stay here because if if I kind of go away, you're going to feel that pain again and that's going to be more painful. So what we need to do is approach our body with that compassion and with that acknowledge that we are not trying to harm ourselves. We're trying to protect ourselves. Did I answer your question? (laughs) Yes, Yes, man, that was good. To, To think that our protective mechanisms have a consciousness and they're aware that if we're not safe, they can't, you know, kind of retire, so to speak. Um, yeah, that's I, lo- I love that word, retired, yeah. And also you mentioned about how people who have been heartbroken, how their shoulders kind of hunch forward and that is the body trying to protect the heart. I would have never put those two things together, but because you do this, you see that. Yeah, this is one of the most common ones. And and I want to clarify here, not everyone that has their holders, mm-hmm. their shoulders hunched over are trying to protect their hearts, but it's one of the most common ones. The other one is people that have an armor here in their throat. It's probably because they were not able to express themselves freely. There is one of our uh, emotional needs in, in our childhood and actually through our whole life is to express ourselves authentically. So if at certain point you couldn't express yourself because your parents were telling you to shut up, to don't say things that way, you don't say that, behave, you start kind of swallowing that back in and suppressing that expression that it was just so natural and and so of a child that is actually want to just express and he's bubbly and he uh, just want to experience joy. So what you start manifesting in your body is a lot of armors here in your neck, in your throat area. And there is something that I teach in my trainings, which is somatic polarity. This area is connected to the pelvic area and to your genitals. So if this area is armor, it's armor, it's most likely like the, the part, the lower part of, of your hips and your pelvic area, it's going to be armor also. So if you're having problems to express yourself authentically for in a verbal way, you probably also are having problems to express yourself authentically in a sexual way because that's what sex is. It's, it's, it's an authentic self-expression. So in a more kind of intimate uh, approach. So it's kind of what we do when we are trying to de-armor the body is to understand where the body is and all of those fragmented parts that our body has been kind of storing from the past, all of those memories that they call implicit memories. We call them implicit because we cannot recall them rationally and that's why we work on the body and how to release them, how to approach them, that we can take our body into the present because that's one of the things that trauma actually does. 
it doesn't allow you to be fully into the present. When you are uh, under the lens of trauma or under the lens of unresolved trauma, you live in either on the past or either in the future, but you're not fully present. Wow. Well, um, you mentioned people who have self-expression, they get armored in their throat. Is that kind of where the saying of like people saying they have a lump in their throat came from? Or is that associated so, with that? I, I have, have, I you ever heard, have you ever heard someone say that they have a lump in their throat? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 one of the most common ones that they have the words here in their mind, but they cannot express them properly. And it's it's, it's something that we learn from young age and from our childhood. If we want to express, and and I'm gonna talk about my own personal experience, and even in our society, there are certain places that you cannot say things the way they come to you but we don't know as a child you know like you want to say so, something and because it's not socially accepted to talk about that or to talk in that kind of a uh, tone or to say that your parents will tell you to Shh, don't say that here no behave but that behave you don't get to understand that when you don't have the tools because our rational mind and our cognitive mind is not fully developed and we don't have the resources and 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 there is this kind of a narcissistic behavior when we are kids that we think that everything is about us. So if our parents are telling us that, yeah, you don't say that, you don't behave, we, we're not going to make the link that is because we are in a public space. It's just because you don't say that and you need to repress that and you cannot express that the way it was coming out. So you start pushing everything down and your body will actually manifest that in your adulthood. It will start kind of showing either as a symptom or either as an armor or as a behavior. Wow, that makes so much sense, especially as a you know as a child. Like in certain places, you're you're not allowed to be a child because you know you have to behave or you have to be quiet. So you're almost told it's not okay to be a child or to be you. And you can't rationalize the fact that you're in a library or you're at church or, you know, you're in a, in a space that need, that requires you to kind of just back off a little bit from being your innate self as a child and playing and laughing and, and just being loud. And I think that, as you mentioned, we can see that as a, a warning signal that it's not OK to be me. And then we carry that into adulthood and we, we lose our voice. Yeah, that's that's one of the most common ones, as as I'm telling you, and and yeah, that's that's the the sign that is being communicated. You, you, your authentic self is not allowed. Mm -hmm. So, and and we don't have the tools to understand that. As I say, you cannot rationalize that you are not in the church, that you are in a library. No, for you, it's just it's about me. As as in our childhood, is everything is about us. So right. and we carry all of those memories and all of those patterns into our adulthood. And then you see the adult that cannot express themselves or the adult that cannot actually set boundaries, which is also quite common because it, it, it doesn't find his voice or her voice, it doesn't hide, uh, find his expression. Hmm. Wow, that's so deep. Um, as I was going through some of your content, I saw a lot of, like interesting things. And um, one of them was um, about the manubrium. So I wanted to ask, what is the manubrium and how is it related to anxiety and energy flow? I love that, that you asked that question because that's actually addressing one of the specific parts that we work in the somatic al alignment process. So basically the manubrium is located at the bottom part of your throat and is the upper part of your sternum. So there is a place also that is called the jugular notch, which is kind of a pocket or a, or a hole that you find in that area. Top part of your sternum, the lower part of your throat. And usually when we talk about anxiety in a more kind of energetic perspective, perspective anxiety, it comes from the Greek word to choke. Where do you choke? You choke here on your throat area. So people that feel anxious, 
when I have clients that they come with extreme anxiety, what they feel is that they don't have and that they actually uh, getting closer to a panic attack that they cannot breathe properly. So that they choke in, that there is no airflow going. And if you see our body structure, anatomical structure, you get to see that the narrower part of the body where the breath goes is here on the neck. So if you go uh, on your chest and of your hips and on your abdomen, it's wider than your neck. So it's pretty much kind of a, imagine that you take a deep inhale, you take it down to your belly, and then when you're going to exhale, those four, imagine a four lane highway that is getting narrow into a two lane, one lane highway. So where you tend to choke is when it's narrow, when there is no actually proper airflow. And the maneuvering is a beautiful point that we can work on in able to, to ignite the energy flow through the body. So when we are another kind of the symptom of someone that has anxiety is that the energy is being stored in the upper part of the body, in the head, because they've run in through different kind of scenarios. You know, if someone is going through an, an, to a panic attack, to a strong anxiety, they kind of go in into, into these future scenarios that they create in some somatic uh, kind of reactions and they thinking a lot and they overthinking. So that means that the energy is being stored here because all of those thoughts, you need the energy to create thoughts. So all of that, the energy is being stored here on the upper part of your body in your head. So what we do when we work in the maneuver room is just to open this part of the neck, this part of the throat, to be able to, to to allow that energy to flow to the lower part of your body. And it's coming from traditional Chinese medicine. What we do is just working on the throat chakra, allowing your expression to come out and allowing the breath actually to flow down to your diaphragm and open up your, your authentic expression and open up that energy that it's been stored in the head. And the other part of the maneuvering when I work on that area is that maneuvering means to handle. So it's kind of a stare, it, 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 it's a Latin word that means a steering wheel. So when we are feeling anxious, we are losing our compass, we're losing our direction. We don't know where to go and that's what creates a lot of anxiety. So if we work in this area that kind of allow our body to find some cues of safety or where do we need to go next. So it's a, an area that is related to that direction that we need in that specific moment. Well, I love how um, even going back to what the, the word means in Greek, it gives you an idea of, you know, how the body is connected so deeply to just, you know, consciousness. And these things are, are simple and we've gotten away from the simplicity of them because I think just life and you know stigmas and fears and all these things have have disconnected us from from our bodies and what our bodies are meant to do and how they're designed yeah i totally agree with that our body has its wisdom that when mm -hmm. we are able to fully connect to fully inquire with a compassionate approach on what our body wants from us uh, we get answers. We we get uh, that certainty on how to move through life. And and just to to add on that one, when we pay attention also to the words that we use, I like to pay attention to the language that we use because the language that we use recreate reality. So as I told you, anxiety comes from from angst, it means to choke. So if it means to choke, where do you choke? It means that there is no airflow. So how can I actually ignite the airflow in my body to release that anxiety? If we pay full attention or, or careful attention to the words that we use in our daily basis, we are able also to find answers. We just throw words out there without kind of that they said losing their meaning. But when we go back to why those words are being used, we get, we we find some some answers. We find some 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 certainties. Hmm. Um, something that you mentioned when you were talking about the throat is uh, the throat chakra, and I I wanted to ask you, um, 
what a chakra is and how they're related to the body and how many um, there are. Because I think a lot of people, when you hear that word chakra, like we were talking about earlier, you know, they kind of think it's something that's related to spiritism or, um, like I said, uh, Santeria and, and things of that nature, because there just isn't a knowledge um, or an understanding of what they are. So can you kind of give a little bit of info on what chakras are? So chakra basically means wheel of energy. It's com mm -hmm. It comes from the Sanskrit word. There are different kind of a school of knowledge on how many chakras are. The most popular is coming uh, from the yoga, yogic tradition, which it says that we have seven chakras or seven wheels or seven energy centers. And every energy center, or those seven energy centers are located through our spinal cord. I don't fully kind of buy that idea and that they are located there because as it's energy, you cannot encapsulate energy in one specific point, but it kind of is, is more kind of surround. Uh, what I, the, the way I like to explain it, it kind of address the surroundings of the area, not just the spinal cord, but also kind of the surroundings. So coming from the yogi tradition, seven different chakras from the base of your spine, to the top of your spine or to the top of your head, which is the crown chakra. Those chakras, I'm gonna mention them fast uh, without getting into details. Every chakra has a meaning and has a right. So when we talk about that energy, how that energy is impacting your overall well-being or your life, what I say when I say that it has a right is, for example, we have the base chakra, which is called the root chakra, and the root chakra. The right that it has is the ability that you develop to feel safe in your own body to kind of your your primal needs so the lower chakras are more related to your human experience and the upper chakras are related to what we might call your etheric field or the way i like to phrase it is the connection to the divine to the source to god to the universe use the word that actually suits you better according to your beliefs, something that goes beyond your rational understanding. First chakra, root chakra, uh, is the root chakra. The second chakra is related to your authentic expression, your, your, your sexual energy, your creative energy, and is located uh, in your, around your genitals, in your pelvic floor. Then we transition to a third chakra, which is the solar plexus, related to your inner power, to your purpose, to what the Buddha uh, or the Buddhists in the Buddhist tradition, they call the Dharma. And then we keep going up to the heart chakra located in your chest, which is located to a connection with the world and people around you. Throat chakra, which is uh, located in your throat, related to coherence, how coherently you are with what you say, what you think and what you do in the world. And that one is connected to the expression also and then I get back to the connection that the throat has with the, with the pelvic floor. So the, the, the throat chakra is connected to the second chakra, which is a sacral chakra. And then we go to the third eye, which is connected to the intuition. And the last chakra, which I actually like to explain, which is the recollection of the other six chakras, which is the connection to the divine, kind of the, the connection with, with the etheric feel, with what it goes beyond your human experience. So that's kind of more or less what I will define as, as chakras. And even if we take it to, to science, uh, this research that have been shown that every single chakra is related to, to, to one hormone and that there is energy that is being stored in those hormones there. In, no, hormones, no, in those glands, sorry, that there is related to, to certain kind of gland. So the most common one, or in the pop culture out there, it's kind of the third eye is related to the pineal gland. So every every chakra is related to one gland and this energy that is being stored in those glands and they affect your endocrine system, your immune system, your uh, somatic system, your nervous system. So that's more or less kind of the explanation that I give from, uh, for chakras. Thank you for that, man. That was very detailed. 
um, and <laughs> also enlightening on what chakras are and what they aren't. Um, because I think I do think there's a lot of misinformation on them. So I appreciate you clarifying that. Um, I wanted to ask next is how is breathing associated with being regulated? So our breath is always reacting to every single experience that we have in our day to day life. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, I was having a talk last week and I was giving this example. Just I will invite you to visualize how your breath will react if you are going to cross the street and a car is going to run over you, what happened to your breath? So when you are in that kind of fight or flight mode, you you kind of inhale, no? your breath immediately, you contract, you inhale, you think that you are experiencing some threat and you do <gasps> something choking is coming towards me. So your breath is reacting. Then if you go to your lover, to your mom, to your wife, to your husband, and you ask for a hug and you are in the arms of that person that you love, the arms of your beloved, and you just there being held in a nourishing, nurturing way, your breath kind of relax, and what you do is that you're gonna exhale. You ah, you let go. So just just to give you an example that your breath is always reacting to the experiences that you are having in your life. Usually we change the way we breathe according to the traumas that we have experienced and to what we are storing. So we're not allowing the energy because our breath is our primal source of energy. If you if you think about where do you take the, the oxygen to break down the, the food chains or the chains that the food that you ingest, you take it from the oxygen and you take oxygen from your breath. So that energy, uh, it's coming from the breath and when you are not uh, allowing your breath to flow because there is contraction in your body because there is armors and your breath is actually not flowing naturally down to your pelvic floor expanding your diaphragm taking more air to your lungs expanding your thoracic cavity open up your chest and allowing the breath to flow properly your body is feeling contracted so your breath is is actually responding to that contraction so what we do in a somatic dearming session, in a somatic alignment session, is to release the armors that, that actually, as a result, you are able to fully breathe properly, to store enough energy, and to keep that constant flow of energy through your body, through your experience, that you are able to actually find alignment. So basically, if your breath is not flowing properly, it's because your body is tense, is contracted, and is not allowing that breath to flow. And if your body is contracted, is tense, and is not allowing the breath to flow, it's probably because there are some armors and some implicit memories that we need to resolve and that we need to release. So it sounds like trauma or um, armors can be like a traffic jam on the highway. That's the way. That's the way I, I, I like to picture it. Yeah, that's that the way it works. So if you if you talk, get back to to anxiety and panic attacks because usually I get a, a lot of clients that they're dealing with anxiety, insomnia, depression. So if you think about someone that has a panic attack, they breathe with their shoulders. They're not able to take down there down to the bellies. So they breathe this way. <sighs> <sighs> they breathe fast, they breathe shallow. There is no, because they don't feel safe. So that sense of not feeling safe, put them into that fight or flight mode, that sympathetic activation that they need to run away from the threat that they are experiencing. So that's what they do. They don't allow the breath to come down. If you are actually able to impact your breath and to work in your breath, to open up the diaphragm and tell them to take the breath, the breath down to the belly, as a consequence, as a byproduct of doing that, they will start to regulate themselves because the best regulatory tool that we have for our nervous system is our breath. How is it possible to take your body and nervous system back to safety? So basically, it's, it's not a one go or a, a, a straight fix. As I will say, it's not something that happened overnight. And why do I want to reinforce this idea? Because I don't want to give 
false hope that people come to me and I've seen many people that come to me and say, okay, I want to have one session and that's it. If you have been in a state of dysregulation where you feel unsafe for X amount of years, it will take you certain time kind of to repattern yourself and to get back or bring back that safety into your body. So first, what you need, it will be commitment. Second one, what I will do in my work is to restore the flow of energy through your breath. We do that by putting your body into a more kind of expansive state. We release the contraction and the armors that not allowing the energy to flow. So we take your body back to the present. As I, as I, as I say, pretty much we work on the breath because the breath is what allow you to be fully connected to the present. And then trauma is, is, is either staying in the past or thinking about the future. And then the present give you more agency on how to react to the kind of the environment or the different experiences that you are dealing with. And then when I say commitment is to develop certain kind of understanding. And that's what we will call the map in your nervous system, when your nervous system is coming out of your window of tolerance or is coming out of that regulated, regulatory state. So when I say mapping is, when we talk about regulation, is the ability to transition between the different states, the, the different states that your nervous system can be in. You can be hyperactive if you experience any kind of threat, if you're doing exercise, you are in a more kind of active mode. You, there's some sympathetic energy running through your system, but you cannot stay in that state for a long period of time. You cannot feel like stress for a long period of time because stress is good, but it's just kind of the amount of time that you feel it. So when you map your nervous system and you are able to actually connect to your inner guidance, to connect with your inner self and you say, okay, I need energy because there is a threat or I need the energy because I'm going to the gym or I need the energy because I'm going to do this activity, but then I'm going to put myself into that state for this amount of time and then I can get back to a place of relaxation or to a place where I feel calm and I feel fully com uh, connected to myself. So when we are getting back to regulation is developing the resilience to allow that allow us to actually transition from a states of activation to a states of relaxation. And that's just by reconnecting yourself to your inner guidance, by understanding yourself, by inquiring in a compassionate way, by releasing the armors, by breathing properly, by talking to yourself, by talking to your body. So there are many tools that we can actually develop in the long run and keep them as habits. Usually what I do with my clients, okay, they come from one session, I give them one or two tools that allow them to actually uh, connect with that essence or connect with that inner guidance that put them again into a state of relaxation. And one simple tool is just to ask yourself, how am I feeling right now? We don't get to pause in our day-to-day -day, uh, life and just ask, am I feeling okay? Am I feeling uh, in a rush? Am I feeling busy? How am I feeling? Ah, oh, I'm feeling that there's this kind of activating energy and that I need to do, 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 and I need to rush things up. What if I take one deep breath down to my belly? I move my diaphragm. I allow the energy to flow properly through my body and I calm myself down. Oh, great. I'm able to take better decisions now. I'm able to actually function better. I'm more clear. So it's, it's again, what I will say, and I'll repeat it over and over again, is to come back to yourself, to reconnect with that inner knowing on how to feel better. It must be really fulfilling for you to have been able to have this healing work that you've done and then now be able to use the tools and the knowledge that you've gained to help other people. Um, how important is that to you? How important is the work that you do? Is, is I, I will say that it's just my life purpose, like to be able to find that by discovering your own experience, because that's what I actually think that makes it sustainable, that I have walked the path and that's what I'm sharing. I'm not sharing something different than what I've done to myself and I've seen those results and just being able to to share it with my community is what I 
to actually consider that is the completion of the hero's journey that started 10 years ago or, or one of kind of the final stages because I will keep growing and I will, I will keep evolving and challenges will keep coming because I still face my own challenges. And that's one of kind of the misunderstandings in this kind of, of journey that people think, ah, you, you reach a state and you're done, you're healed. No, we keep facing life because keep, life keeps happening and then we keep developing different resources and different tools that allow us to navigate life. At the end, what we do is to relate to life in a different way, not to get stagnant. So to be able to walk my own path and then after I've done that, to share it with my community for the greater for the greater good of, of all of them, of my family, my clients, people around me, because it impacts every single aspect of my life. Uh, I think that is the most fulfilling uh, experience that I that I done is is what I would call my my dharma, and I have this prayer that I usually have a prayer every time that a client come to me, and and that prayer starts actually by being grateful to my guides to to my higher self, to, to the divine guidance that I get, to be able actually to help people because that actually brings me a lot of joy and a lot of fulfillment. That's wonderful, bro. Thank you for sharing that, um, your heartfelt expressions. If someone wanted to work with you, how would they go about it and what programs do you offer? So basically at the moment, um, fully focused on trainings. Uh, I'm delivering trainings uh, to actually share the tools that have been developing during the last 10 years, the somatic alignment process. Uh, trainings uh, this year in 2023, they fully booked. We have trainings here in Malta and in Germany. And trainings for next year, they are out uh, in the website. I'm not going to say the, web the website is somaticenergyalignment.com. I guess it's a little bit confusing for people. So if you can actually put in the notes of the sure. episode, that would be better. And we have trainings for 2024 in Australia, Germany, and the US. I'm going to, to San Diego. That's kind of my main or my priority at this moment, kind of to, to pass the knowledge and to pass. My first mentor used to refer to that process, at that, uh, as that process as passing the torch. At a certain point when we develop certain skills, you will pass your torch and, and you will tell people to keep that torch lit and spreading the light all around. That's what I'm doing. But I'm also accepting clients one-on-one. -on -one. If people want to work in sessions with me, uh, they will find that information. Usually I work online. We can do the work online because people are kind of reluctant to this kind of work online. And I will, I will say probably around every, from every 10 people, eight that come to me, they work with me online. And at the end, I'm just guiding them. So it's not that I'm doing something different. If you are in person and you are online, I can guide you during the whole process on how to de-armor yourself and you can actually get the tools. So that are kind of the two ways that people can work with me at the moment. Either if you want to learn the process or if you want to have sessions, uh, you'll find everything in my website. Perfect. Thank you for that, brother. All right. So last question. Um, if someone is on the fence about um, talking to someone about their anxiety or starting their healing journey, how would you use your platform to encourage them? And what would you say? What I will say, and I will get back to kind of the the first thing that we address at the beginning, which is trauma or what you're experiencing at this moment is not a life sentence. We have the ability to change and change is the only constant in this kind of universe. So we have the ability to keep evolving. So don't buy into the idea that there is no way to change, that there's no way to improve, that there's no way to actually get better, whatever you're experiencing out there. And ask for help, ask for guidance. You don't need to put all of the burden of your, uh, of your problems and your challenges and your obstacles over your shoulders. We have 
different kind of, uh, that, or there are many people out there willing to help you. And this, we, we have this idea of self-help, self-help, and I need to do everything by myself. Uh, no, let's transition more from self-help into collect, collective help and, and ask for help. Raise the hand up and say, okay, I need your guidance. I need to sort this out. And many people will be willing to actually guide you into that reconnection to your inner self, that reconnection into wholeness. Thank you for that, man. That was great encouragement. Um, thank you for this. Um, this, this has been a, a, an amazing interview and your knowledge and your skill set, you, you provided so much wisdom and information and gave such a, um, a clear picture into how the body and the breath and the nervous system and so many things are involved in our health and how we can establish these or over time we can, you know, pick up these armors and things that can prevent us from being whole and healthy. So thank you so much for this. Thank you for agreeing to do this with me and thank you for your time. Thank you, brother. Thanks for giving me this opportunity for your beautiful audience out there. And, and yeah, thanks for spreading the word because this is a beautiful work that you're doing here. I appreciate that. If someone wanted to find you uh, online or on social media, where can they find you? So as I said, uh, the website is somaticenergyalignment.com. And probably the easiest way and where I'm more responsive is Instagram. You find me at santi.02. And whatever you need, just, just let me know. I'm usually, I try or do my best to reply to every single message that I get out there. So it might take time, but I, but I do. <laughs> okay, brother. Thank you again, Santi, for this. This has been amazing. Um, you truly are uh, a healer and the work that you do is so powerful. So thank you for who you are, for what you do and for how you do it. Thank you, brother.